The Word of God from the Gospel of St. John, John 3, beginning at verse 1. There was a man, and that was enough to get us started. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. If you recall, the uh, Bible is not divided up into chapter and verse for the first millennia. And so for over a thousand years, we read it flowing all together. And I still think that's the way it should be read because... Uh, Quite frankly, we have context. Uh, right before this verse, we have discussion about Jesus. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in men. The point there is that God in Christ Jesus has complete, sufficient knowledge of humanity. Ladies, you can say men if you want to. That's what the text says. New men. There was a man. And so obviously this man is one of these that have been discussed in context. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. And then we pause there and consider. He's come by night. He's in secret. If you look at Nicodemus in the Gospel of St. John, he makes three appearances, and in each appearance, he makes further movement towards discipleship. He starts here, come to question Jesus. He is one of those who is of night. That's not just a time of day, that's a spiritual status. He is a person of night. Uh, he, he has position in the community, but he's afraid. He doesn't want to be known to be one coming to Jesus. And yet his spiritual category, there's some darkness there. And this longing for more. And so he comes to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we. Now is that the royal we? He is a ruler of the Jews, the text says. Is it a royal we? We know. No, it's not a royal we. Again, the context. It refers back to two verses in the previous chapter at verse 23. Now, when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus himself did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in men. And so this Pharisee, Nicodemus, I call him Nick at night. He's Nicodemus come by night, you know, Nick at night. He represents these people who want to follow Jesus because of the signs. Now you're wondering what signs. Oh, come on. Yell out, nah. Anyway, what signs? They, they've asked for a sign. Verse 18, what sign do you give us since you do these things? He's cleansed the temple. And the Jewish authorities take offense that he cleanses the temple. And so they say, what sign do you do? that you have the authority to do these things. And he doesn't give them a sign. He gives them a prophecy of the resurrection. Destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. But this he spoke of his body as the temple. He doesn't give a sign. What does he do? Back up to verse 17, chapter 2. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Why zeal for the house of God? Psalm 69 verse 9. Because he's cleansed the temple. He's gone in and just run the money changers out and overturned tables and cleansed the temple. The only sign he gives is zealousness. What's the problem with that? It connects back into this idea of what was in man. And so Jesus doesn't commit to them because he knows what's in man. What's in man? Well, 
in Hebrew scripture, who represents zealousness? We talked about it two weeks ago. Have you slept since then that you don't remember Phinehas, the nephew of Moses, who stops the pandemic by murdering a couple who are engaged in an affair in the very presence of Moses in the sight of the temple? And so Phinehas goes down as the sign of zealousness. And so they've given Jesus over to be one like Phinehas, who in violence cleanses the temple. But Jesus knows what's inside them. He doesn't need anybody to explain men to them. And so their representative, the religious leader, one of the men, come to Jesus. One who is by night. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The implied question is, can you give me something, Jesus? You're a teacher sent from God. We see the sign of zealousness on you. Can you give me something from God? You're of God. Can you give me something? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you see how that would, taken out of context, be confusing? You're a teacher sent from God. You've got to be born again. It's almost like it's two different conversations. You put it back in context and it makes sense. He's asking, can you give me something from God? And Jesus said, yeah, you've got to have a spiritual birth. Now, Jesus doesn't make it easy on Nicodemus. He uses words that can be understood, translated in several ways. In a minute, we'll hear about the wind. The wind blows where it wills. Trouble is, it's the exact same word for spirit. And so he's actually talking about a spirit wind. But for now, being born again also literally translates as being born from above. Nicodemus thinks born again, physical birth. Jesus is actually speaking of a spiritual birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, he will say. How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? He's lost. He's of men. He has nothing of the Spirit about him, but he knows instinctively there's got to be more. I need something from God. I need more. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's going to be several parallels One is going to talk about the kingdom. One is going to talk about being born. Here we hear born again and born of water and the Spirit. So what does he mean by water and the Spirit? Ladies, what's the first physical sign that the baby's on the way? Water breaks. And it's the water of a womb. You've got your physical birth. You're standing here, Nicodemus. You just need to add to your physical birth. When we baptize someone, are we not remembering the water of a womb? And so add to that physical birth a spiritual birth, a birth from above. He's fixing to give us a treatise on the Holy Spirit. Today's Trinity Sunday, by the way, in addition to being Sunday of Memorial Day. And the Messiah is fixing to take us to school along with the teacher of Israel. And we're going to get schooled right off the bat by the Messiah on the nature of the Holy Spirit. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, add to that the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. That's another place it sounds like they just took off and went in different directions, doesn't it? It's okay to say I'm a bit confused. How does that go together? 
Well, again, we're talking about a, a spirit wind. Wednesday, Berta and I got back from our trip to Baltimore. Did y'all see the pictures of me on the sub? I think it was a six inch rather than a foot long. That was a small sub. And so we get back to my cousin's house in Annapolis and my bride says to me, take me to the academy. You know what Wednesday was in Annapolis? Graduation day. God is my witness. Sailors everywhere, parents, grandparents. I think they were bringing along the neighbors. It was crowded. Wednesday was also a, a race day in Annapolis. I saw one t-shirt a guy was wearing that says, Annapolis is a drinking town with a sailing problem. They were covered up in ships. And every one of those ships in that harbor had sails on it. Millions and millions of dollars on sailing ships. And my cousin said, now I'll take you to dinner at the yacht club, but I'm on the race committee. And so I've got to go out and help set out the course and, and judge the race. And so whenever I get finished, I will join you. You just go ahead and eat. And so we made it down to the yacht club through the crowd of all the sailors and their families and the neighbors. And I think even the people that didn't like them. I mean, that place was crowded. And we get down there and Amy has beat us there. The race is canceled. Why would they cancel a race? Anybody guess? There was no wind. You can't have uh, millions of dollars. Did I mention how much money they were investing in those things? I mean, these things were bigger than an RV and just all kinds of automated everything. Push one button and the anchor drops. Push another button and the sail goes up. I mean, it's crazy how much money they were putting in those things. No wind, no race. What Jesus tells us today is no Holy Spirit, no birth from above. The wind blows where it wishes. We're not going to control this spirit wind, this second birth from God. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So that's connecting spiritual birth with the movement of the Holy Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. You cannot tell where it comes from, where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What is everyone born of the Spirit doing linking back to the wind blows where it wills? Thank you for asking. On days they actually have the wind and they run those million dollar boats. They can't control the wind, they can set sail. They can position themselves to receive. That's what we do. We don't control God. We don't start God, we don't stop God. But when God moves, we can receive God. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, come by night, knows there's got to be more. And Jesus is saying, position yourself to receive the Holy Spirit. You're not going to control God. You're not going to control this second birth. You can receive it if you receive what God offers. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? First, we've had a treatise on the Holy Spirit. Now, the Messiah is going to tell us about the ministry of the Messiah. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? Now, pause by there for a second. Who's in this story? Jesus, Nicodemus. Who wrote the story? Or at least who told the story? Nicodemus. Turns out that's actually sort of like prophecy. Are you the teacher of Israel? Well, he's fixing to become the teacher when the teacher gets to school. Jesus is going to school Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is going to tell that story for the rest of his life. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak 
what we know. Now earlier I said the we could have either been Nicodemus using a royal we or Nicodemus representing all the men folk who want to follow Jesus because of the signs. This we is we, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The triune God. We speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. That's a charge he places against Nicodemus. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Did you notice that all this Jesus has been talking about? The wind moving, spiritual birth. He's calling earthly things as glorious as salvation is. To God, it's just an earthly thing. The real glory is the heavenly stuff. We know, we speak what we know, testify what we've seen, and you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man. We have a treatise on the Holy Spirit. Now the Messiah tells us the ministry of the, Holy, uh, of the Messiah. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Again, that feels disjointed unless we put it in context. What's the story of Moses and the serpent? Numbers 21, fiery serpents are sent to chastise the people of God because of their disobedience. And they go to Moses and ask for help, relief, and Moses prays. And God says, make a bronze serpent and mount it on a pole and put it in the center of the camp. Now there's three million Jews. This is a big camp. This is not one of the camps we got lining the Tennessee River. This is a big camp. So it must have been a tall pole. And it shall be, the text says, that when the one is bitten, if they will look on the serpent, they will be healed. Can you imagine the first guy that got bit at that point, what he would have done? You gotta be kidding. Looking at a snake on a stick is gonna do something about this fiery serpent biting me? You know, it takes faith to act like that. It takes some sense of believing the one who spoke for you to respond. And it was a prophecy of the Messiah. Jesus becomes the serpent. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. He's the serpent on the pole. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus becomes the curse so that you and I can have our curse removed. Who is it that does it? That's the third person we want to talk about of the Godhead, the Father. For God so loved the world. Now again, all this is together. All this is kept in context. I know we always hear John 3, 16, lift it out. Today, put it back. Keep it in context. The ministry of the Messiah is to be the curse so that our curse is removed. Who thought of this? Who is it that wanted this? For God so loved the world. The Father is the origin of our salvation. That he gave his only begotten son in early service. We had in our prayer time one person raising for prayer a mother who for the second time in 14 months will be burying a child. Can you imagine how horrible that is? That's not the way it's supposed to be, is it? You're not supposed to bury your children. Your children are supposed to bury you. And it's happened not once, it's happened twice in 14 months for this poor lady that we pray for. God comfort her. 
And yet none of us chose that. The Father does. Such is God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, now see that whoever is like the whoever of Moses. You remember the first guy that gets bit by the snake thinks, should I even bother looking at that snake on a stick? Oh, what the heck, it's not going to hurt anything. And he turns and looks, and he's healed. And the first one that hears of the Messiah, can God really save someone like me as much as I have sinned? Would God want to save me? You've got to trust that God is that loving, that giving, to have that kind of faith. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And see, that everlasting life is life with God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, life together. Life with God for all eternity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, everlasting life. And it begins today for those who receive. But that's not the end. One more verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Notice it doesn't say will be. God's just given us opportunity. Would you take that opportunity? By faith, would you receive the ministry of the Messiah, spirit empowered, origined in the Father, might be saved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.